record and good day, everyone. Um, thank you once again for attending our second of three webinars related to the updates to the body of knowledge guide. And as Richard has already said, I would just want to reiterate a special thank you to James and Pierre for your heavy lift and not just in presenting these webinars. This is probably the easy stuff. It's a heavy lift to get to this point. Um, that you both did and working with your teams and so many other contributors on the Body of Knowledge Guide 3.0. So on behalf of LBL Strategies, welcome. If you're attending live or if you are viewing this at a later date, we wanna welcome you and appreciate your um, common commitment that we share to the discipline of strategy management. Uh, next slide, please. So Randy just touched on this uh, during the first, um, webinar and I wanted to kind of highlight it again. We know many who are part of this or who have registered for this webinar series are our alumni. And one of our ongoing commitments to our alumni is to stay current with the Body of Knowledge Guide um, in our Mastering Strategy program. And Randy highlighted some of the um, nuanced um, iterations or changes that are coming to our framework that we are building into the course. And so as our continued commitment to our alumni, just so you can see how we are continuing to hopefully keep everyone current in our ecosystem with the um, updates to the Body of Knowledge Guide. And then those who are not alumni, this is our invitation. We would love for you to be alumni someday. And if you, especially those who have not yet that for International for Association of Strategy Professional Certification, and you would like to prepare for the exam, we would be more than happy to talk to you about one of our iterations of the Mastering Strategy course. And you can see listed there on the, on the left-hand side, we have our, we're currently in the fall 10-week program. I think we're a little over halfway through this iteration. It will be offered again um, beginning February 7th. That program runs for 10 consecutive Tuesdays, um, a couple hours. If you happen to miss, um, Richard kindly records each of those sessions and makes those available. So if you have questions about the 10-week program to help prepare for AS IASP certification, be more than happy to talk to you about that. We also have the entire framework in our self-paced modules um, available in a self-paced format, and you can reach out to me um, if you have questions about either one of those offerings. So with that, again, thank you, James and Pierre, and I'll turn the microphone over to you. Hello, everyone. I hope everybody's doing well. So as we discussed last uh, week, there are five group of activities that are required to succeed in strategy. Formulate, as you all know, you devise the strategy, and then you must do the transformations. And then once you've transformed your organization, you can execute. And this cycle, formulate, transform, and execute is supported by two other activities which we call engage stakeholders and govern. So the objective of this uh, webinar this week is to talk about transform and execute. So I will start with transform and Jim will come after me and discuss about execution and you will see that they are tightly knit together. And as we discussed last week, we will talk about concept and activities because the tools uh, as uh, I think we also mentioned last week in the updated version that's going to be published, I would say within two weeks, you will have already 50 tools detailed. But this is not the objective of the webinar, but still you can reference to them in the official book. Okay, so in the section transform organization, there are seven key concepts that we deemed were important to include. Okay, uh, strategic alignment, strategic accountability, organizational transformation, or design, target enterprise architecture, transformation plan, and transformation project. I will present you the first four now, and I will present you the last three while I explain to you the activities instead of repeating myself twice. So what is strategic alignment? Well, it's the ensemble of activities required to ensure that all stakeholders come together in agreement and work jointly in a focused and committed fashion to make the strategy work and achieve long-term objectives, okay? Strategic uh, alignment implies that resources, uh, capabilities, the culture, 
that everything be linked together in order to achieve goals. We define two types of strategic alignment, one which is internal and what which is external. By external alignment, we mean is the firm providing what the market wants, right? And when we talk about internal alignment, well, there are basically two types, whether it's vertical or horizontal. And vertical means if you go from the board to the lower level, are all of these groups aligned together to reach the objectives and committed together? And when we talk about horizontal, well, if you look within a department or within a unit, are people within that unit strategically aligned to reach their own objectives, which in turn will allow the firm to attain his higher level objectives? So this is the first concept. The second concept, which you're all familiar with, is strategic accountability, which represent individual and or shared responsibility for result, again, in alignment with identified goals and objectives. And it's very important that when we talk about accountability, there's not only individual accountability, but there's also group and shared accountability. Because don't forget, the overall goals of the firm are achieved if each department or units achieve its goal, which in turn is achieved if the department achieves its goal, which in turn is achieved if people within this department can achieve their goal. Okay. So that's very important. So what is necessary to have strategic alignment? Well, you can see at the bottom of the slide, goals have to be tied to the stakeholder value proposition. That's one of the first thing I do whenever we do a strategy. What are the goals? What do we want to achieve? And how do we tie them to the stakeholder value proposition? And don't forget, as Jim mentioned last week, there's not only the customer value proposition, there's also the owner, the partner, and the employee at a minimum. And if you look to a public body, well, probably there will be other types of stakeholders. So you have to address all of these stakeholders in order for your strategy to be a success. Then, of course, what are the roles and what are the responsibilities? They have to be clear. So how do you align the people to the performance expectation and the performance plan? How do you monitor and how do you report performance? And, of course, how do you provide the incentives for everybody to achieve, to achieve the goals and, of course, to take accountability of what they have to do. The third concept, which, again, I think most of you are familiar with, is organizational transformation. Uh, I think a lot of people start to use this word, started to use this word, I would say, a decade ago. But in reality, uh, when I did my PhD exam in 1994, I already had a book on that. It's just that now it kind of morphed because we talk about a lot, a lot about technology, but at, at the basic, an organizational transformation is the process of transforming an organization to align the operating model to the new strategy. And if you remember when we spoke about the operating model last week, it's how the organization functions. So it's the process, the capabilities, we'll see that a, a little bit later. So... A normal transformation originates usually from the formulation or the update of a strategy. The more the strategy change, the more the organizational transformation is going to be important. When you do a normal transformation, it implies that you will execute three groups of activities. Okay, You will, of course, transform, but you will also do engage and you will also do govern. But the engage and the govern that you will do will be specifically tied to the transform activities, okay? And don't forget, even though there's one org transformation, there could be many, many transformations within the organization, and the sum of all of these transformations represents the complete org transformation. And when somebody talks about digital transformation, for me, it simply entails that you're going to significantly leverage IT when you transform yourself. So for me, a digital transformation at its basis is an org transformation in which you want to maximize the use of IT to get as many benefits as you can. The last concept prior to going to the activities is org design. Okay, so what is org design? It's a process of configuring the operating model. Okay, again, in such a fashion that it's aligned to the strategy. Org design has six key concepts, strategy, work and innovation, people, structure and coordination, supporting systems, 
and leadership. So basically, when you're going to do org design, you're going to look at each of these six aspects. You're going to envision how you want them to be in the future, and you're going to kind of configure them in order to be able to better achieve your strategy objectives. And as you will see in a few minutes, there's a lot of overlap, or I would say complementarity between org design and enterprise architecture. So when, whenever people ask me to explain what are, what are the transformation activities, I love to, to use the metaphor of building a bridge. So let's say you want to build a bridge. Okay? Typically, there are four key activities. The first, uh, I'll take the example of the bridge that was uh, created in uh, Montreal, where I live. I think it was like it was complete four years ago. But it, the project began, I think, 2010. How did it begin? Well, the mayor and his team started to envision a bridge. So then they decided the requirements of the bridge. Is there going to be one bridge? Uh, to go and come? Is there going to be two bridges, one to go, one to come from Montreal to the South Shore? Uh, are people going to pay when they go on the bridge? Is it going to be modern, et cetera, et cetera? So the key requirements are the first phase, and they're typically done by the customer, which in this case is a city. Once the requirements are established, of course, the city has to work with a, an engineering company specialized in building bridge. So how does it work? Well, the first thing they do is they design what's called an overall plan, okay? An overall plan is not a detailed plan. It's a plan of the complete bridge at a high level that explains the key components, for example, the foundation, the substructure, the superstructure, and is there going to be an arch? Is there not going to be an arch? Uh, uh, how is going to be the deck? Uh, are there going to be any pillars? And so forth and so on. So it's at a high level a picture of the complete bridge and how the components interact together. Once they do that, or in parallel, the engineering, uh, the engineers, they're going to design what's called a master schedule. Okay, and the master schedule is to construct the the bridge from the first piece to once it's complete four or five years later. Okay, and of course, this again is at a high level, and the objective of the master schedule is, of course to implement the design overall plan that they designed previously or in parallel. Once this is done, well, then all of the sub-projects, they call them sub-projects, they're executed, okay? And these could be subdivided in many ways, but what's important that you understand is that the design, the, the overall plan does not go into the details of every part of the bridge. It just provides an overall holistic pictures and how everything is connected together. And then whenever each of the sub-projects is executed, well, the people in charge of the particular project, they do further design, but they follow the guidelines that were based in the design overall plan. And of course, they try to respect the schedule of the master schedule, okay? So this is typically the way it's done. And this is typically the way I think every company should tackle an organizational transformation. So what does that mean? That means they shouldn't go from requirements to projects. They should do an overall plan and they should do a master schedule. So what does that mean? So if you do the parallel into strategy, while well, the requirements, you figure it out is formulate the strategy. So what's the stakeholder value proposition? Uh, what are the goals that we want to achieve? The success factor that Jim mentioned, all of that are the requirements. And the design of the overall plan, the master schedule, and the execution of all of the project, the sum of that, I call that the transformation activities. And if we go into more details, well, the overall plan, we call a target enterprise architecture. The master schedule, we call the transformation plan. And the sub-project, we call transformation projects. Okay, and don't forget, there's one target enterprise architecture, there's one transformation plan, but there are many transformation projects. That's what it's at in, in, in the plural. So another thing you have to remember, as we discussed last year, all of the activities are done together, okay? Because you have to try to build your bridge or you have to transform your organization with agility. 
So while I'm designing part of the TEA of the trans of the target architecture, or maybe Jim is designing the transformation plan, and maybe Doug is executing one project of another slice of the organization. So don't forget, even though there's a sequence that says target transformation plan transformation project, in reality, you must do these three activities together exactly the same way as you must do the five group of activities together. And that's why it's difficult. And that's why we need govern activities to govern all of these activities together so that we always, or we at least try to go in the right direction. So what is a target enterprise architecture? Well, it's a blueprint, a blueprint that defines, again, as I mentioned at a high level, how the organization and its assets will function to be able to execute the new strategy. So think of it as, let's say we want you, you want to build a new house. What is your house going to look like at a high level? Not the details of the rooms and the dining room and the kitchen, but a high level. How many rooms will you have? On what floor will they be? Uh, and so forth. What does that mean? That means that the target enterprise architecture defines the operating model that we mentioned before. So designing the enterprise architecture is the same thing as designing the operating model, but depending to who you speak, they will use a different vocabulary. So that's why we deem appropriate to talk, to use both terms in the book. There's one enterprise architecture. Many people make this mistake. There's one enterprise architecture that has many facets, okay? If you look in the graph, you see three high-level facets. The first is the business architecture, which are the processes, the capabilities, uh, 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 the know-how that you need, the information that you need. Then, of course, there's the IT enterprise architecture, the system, ERP system, and so forth that you're going to need. But don't forget, there can be other architectures. And if you take a company like Toyota, they will have a very, I would say, non-developed IT enterprise architecture, but their manufacturing architecture is going to be extremely well-developed. And if you look at Amazon, well, Amazon, in addition to having a business architecture facet and an IT facet, well, believe it or not, they have a plane facet or delivery facet because they have a lot of distribution centers. They have plane, they have trucks. They, got, they need to manage all that. And to do that, they need an overall plan. If you get into the details, I won't go into the details, but it's in a similar fashion than when you do org design Remember, I, I talked about strategy, skill, people, and so forth. When, when you design your enterprise architecture, while well, you will design the building blocks, okay? I call them building blocks. There are nine types of building blocks. The key building block is the capability. And it, what is a capability? A capability is what the organization is capable of doing. So why is it in the middle? Because for every capability, you will require what are the things that are around, whether there be processes or unit function brands and so forth. But I don't want to go into the detail, but what's important that you understand is when you design the, the operating model, well, you got to figure out at a high level what all of these things are going to be prior to launching your projects, because this will allow you to sequence them and to group them in a good fashion so, so that you respect the dependencies. Okay, so when you design the target enterprise architecture, it's important that you realize that you must design, you must model and document. Because a lot of people, they see the word design and they think doing some drawings. Yes, drawings are important, but of course you gotta model that, okay? Hopefully in a system. And of course you gotta document that and record that so that you can be agile. And so that when you update your architecture, you have something to build on, okay? And as I mentioned before, your target enterprise architecture has to be designed by slices, okay? That provides agility. So it's not because we designed the operating model of the whole company that we're going to start a transformation plan for the whole company and we're gonna do projects for the whole company. Maybe we're gonna take a department, a capability or so forth. We had a question about that last week. And of course, Designing the architecture, there's a sub-process because designing uh, a slice of the architecture is the same thing as doing a normal project. So you will initiate, you will tie it to the strategy, and of course, you will design and implement. So what's the transformation plan? So don't forget, there's one transformation plan for organization, okay? There are not many. If there are more, if there are more than one transformation plan, it's usually because the organization has, has subunits 
that are not linked together. So typically a transformation plan provides all of the transformations that you wanna do to transform your business model. And what do I mean by transformations? If we go back to this slide, we mean every process, every org unit, every business function, everything that you want to transform has to be in your transformation plan. And what do you do with them? Well, you group them into project and then you sequence them. Okay. And don't forget, think about the bridge. How are you going to construct the whole bridge? Are you going to start with the arch or are you going to start with the foundation? Well, you will definitely start with the foundation or it's never going to work. So it's the same idea. You identify everything you, you need to transform, and then you regroup them in a logical fashion, and then you sequence them, okay? So, uh, and when you design a transformation plan, it's important that you understand that typically, typically a plan is designed for five years, but the first two, three years are gonna be much more detailed than the last two, three years. And of course, as you go along, and as you refine, as, and, and as you're being agile, well, of course you will detail further the, the, the year of the plan in which you're beginning, okay? And I just wanna uh, talk again, again about agility. I love agility, but for me, the first way to do agility is to have an architecture and that you build this architecture in an agile fashion, which means by slices, as Jim and I discussed last week. So, how do you design a transformation plan? Well, you have a picture here. I, I'll just go very fast on it, but you can see that the city see it in the box. So you must consider, of course, the strategy because it has to be tried a strategy. You have to consider, of course, the target enterprise architecture and the current. And don't forget, every company has a current architecture, whether it's documented or not. As soon as you have a process and you have something that's being executed in strategy, you have an architecture. And of course, you have to abide to regulation. And in addition to these four key inputs that you see in black, well, of course, is the project essential to the strategy? Is it not? What are the benefits that the project is going to provide? What are the costs? How are you going to do change management? What are the risks? Is the firm ready? And has it, does it have the capacity to transform? And of course, what are the dependencies? That's one of the big faults that people have when they do strategy. They say, okay, we want to provide this benefit to customers, and they try to go directly to the benefits, but they forget the prerequisite projects that they must do to be able to actually provide these benefits to the customers. So that's why uh, one of the key reasons why we uh, encourage the development of a transformation plan, which, by the way, is a way of doing portfolio management, or probably most of you know the term portfolio management, but the particularity is it is based on the architecture. It is not based on whims. It's based on a detailed transformations that you're going to do to transform your operating model. So what happens when you have the transformation plan? Well, then once you design the transformation plan, you will, of course, identify the transformation projects. So what's a project? Well, you all know what a project is. It's a temporary endeavor that creates a unique product service and that provides a specific results, okay? It can be short or long, okay? Some projects are 40, 50 years long when you create a, uh, a barrage as we see in France or a bridge could take 10 years, okay? And what you have to understand is when you have a particular project that emanates from the transformation plan. When I mean emanates, it means it has to come from the transformation plan. Don't do a project if it's, it was not pre-designed in the transformation plan, because if you do that, there's a big chance that you will forget some prerequisite and you will forget to what you need to tie that project later in the transformation to be sure that you reach your benefits. So transformation project is a particular project that's involved in the transformation of the organization, which emanates from the transformation plan. And when you execute projects, don't forget, there's not only one project, there's one transformation plan in which there can be 10, 20, 50 projects. It depends, you may have even programs. And once you get to every project, well, then you will have a team to focus on that project. And what will that team do? Well, they will follow the typical phase that you see on the screen, initiate, planning, execute, monitor, close, which are the typical PMI activities. And another thing that you have to understand 
is once you get into the execution of the project, there will be more design. Because don't forget, when you do the architecture, the enterprise architecture, you do a high level design. And when you get into the project, you will do a detailed design of the part of the transformation that you want to address. So that's very important. And that ensures alignment, right? And how are you going to be sure that this is aligned? Well, you see monitoring and controlling. Well, this is going to be tied to the governed activities that we mentioned in the strategy activities, which we will see next week. And if you want to succeed in your projects, don't execute them prior to having a transformation plan. Have a project manager, which is responsible for budget and schedule. Have a solution architect, which is basically responsible of the content. And of course, you need a sponsor, which is very common vocabulary in the strategy world. But this is not enough. If it's a very highly technical project and there's a lot of IT components, while you will have a lot of people involved in the project, you can have business analysts, SMEs, developer, tester, uh, uh, process specialists, even the strategist can come and give his, his opinion in specific cases. So a lot of people can be involved in the transformation projects. Up to you, Jim. Thanks, Pierre. And we'll be uh, taking questions in the chat and we'll make sure we have carve out some time uh, after I speak to answer all of your questions, whether they're in the chat or live. Let me start my video here. So we'll talk about execute strategy. So while all this is going on, while you're formulating your strategy, as we talked last week, as we build and start executing the transform activities, um, you're still executing the existing strategy and the transform activities are to get us, to enable us to execute on the new strategy. So uh, as Pierre talked about, we'll talk about concepts and activities. Pierre, next slide, please. So we have four key concepts, concepts of operations. We wanna talk about the execution challenges. We wanna talk about the notion of continuous improvement and operational excellence. And these came out of our research a couple of years ago from real practitioners of their challenges in aligning the organization, the current operating model to the new strategy as Pierre highlighted. So let's talk about each of these in turn before we talk about the key concepts, um, the key activities. As I mentioned last week, the notion of a value chain of activities that is going to be uh, executed upon to deliver value to your stakeholders. And as Pierre mentioned again, you've got your customers as well as your external stakeholders, your business partners, et cetera, in your ecosystem. And don't forget about your employees. So it's the value added activities of an organization directly related, providing goods or services to the particular market. So the core activities could be manufacturing if you're uh, making parts and uh, machinery and so forth, could be distributing those parts to the various markets uh, or selling product and services. Spent a lot of time helping Ford through this entire value chain back in the mid eighties to uh, catch up with their uh, Japanese competitors at the time. And they were at a seven year cycle time Toyota was a three and a half cycle time. So the, our challenge on that project was identifying the non-value adding activities so that we can actually execute all of those key operations successfully. Now on the slide, we talk about specific aspects of two different types of organizations, a government agency perhaps. Um, and if you talk to, and those of you who have, uh, and I know there's a few government uh, retired executives on this call, uh, policy making is very important as a value adding activity for agencies. That's interpreting legislation that Congress enacts into rules and regulations to get them to guide operations. On nonprofits, advocacy is probably the biggest non uh, value adding activity that uh, an, an association can do, whether you're advocating on perhaps of an industry or advocating on perhaps of a member within that industry. I just recently helped an agricultural retail association, and this was uh, reiterated in our strategic offsite that advocacy was their number one value adding activity that their members uh, wanted to have them to be the best in the world because no one else was really taking care of that for them. But you also have some other things in there as listed on inside the block. Next slide, please. Okay. 
if you have access to the BAC, you'll see it's chock-a-block full of various statistics on many studies from one of the seminal works back in the 90s by uh, Kaplan and Norton in terms of why organizations uh, fail. And the classic book on the execution um, by ba Larry Bosley, also about the same time in the mid-80s. But there's other research that comes from uh, the PMI Institute in terms of the Bright Line Initiative as well as a, a, a IASP, LBL, George Washington University study on particular execution challenges with respect to the uh, government sector, whether it's federal, uh, local, uh, or regional. But in one aspect, there is a lack of strategic thinking. So if you're not taking the time that we talked about last week in terms of formulating your strategy based on really good strategic thinking, looking at external environment, looking at your own capabilities internally, um, you may have uh, trouble in that execution. Second, um, aligning the operating model, um, it's not easy as you might occur to you based on Pierre's discussion, it's a lot of work involved. There could be a lot of work involved. And we've seen organizations that they have a new strategy, but their operating model, the capabilities just couldn't operate it very well. So that alignment is what we heard from our uh, researchers that as a key role of a strategic uh, planner or a strategist is to help the rest of the organization with that uh, alignment to the operating model. Again, it's not easy. Uh, you may have a deficiency in terms of engaging the resources. If you heard Pierre talk about earlier that it's all about uh, engagement with the various people that you might need, depending on the complexity of what you need to change aka transform in order to execute on new strategy. Last week, Pierre used the analogy of you do really well distributing products in the United States. Now you wanna go into England um, or Europe. You got a whole bunch of stuff you have to get ready to be able to do that effectively. Not only legal, regulations, licensing, training, hiring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So some transformations uh, are going to take a little bit of time before it can be very successful execution. And then that a lot of research came out of PMI two years ago about, you know, exactly the same. OK, we got that strategy. We'll just let everyone kind of do its own thing and we'll uh, execute that. Uh, Chris, excellent question. Next week, we'll be talking about engaging. So I'll, I'll, I'll maybe have some time to talk about engagement. But one of the key things is planning out your overall engagement strategy and plan. Uh, and we'll talk about that in detail uh, next Tuesday. Next slide, please. Okay, continuous improvement. So whether you're practicing, you know, standard Toyota method, continuous improvement, or any very sophisticated methodologies like Lean Six Sigma, theory of constraints, um, it's really a mindset of practicely, uh, practice of re-examining how you're delivering product services and or executing your processes, both internal supporting processes, as well as those value adding activities to your uh, customers. So again, it encompasses both operations and supporting activities. If you have a bad way of or inefficient way of hiring staff to execute, um, that's a supporting activity that you need to probably do some transformation and continuous improvement. Um, it could be a result of efficiency focus, effectiveness focus, or agility focus that creates long-term value. And it should be part of the ongoing governance the evaluation process, uh, whether it's an agile manner or not. And one of the things we heard from the people that participated in our research a couple of years ago, one key role they strategists said they found themselves doing is how do they help the organization create a culture of agility? Um, and that was why we focused on that aspect in the body of knowledge. And as you'll see, the next iteration or release of the body of knowledge will have over 50 different techniques, including continuous process improvement techniques, approaches, and methodologies. Here. Last concept, operation excellence. So this is even goes beyond that continuous improvement at the shop floor, or at the, the, the front desk, uh, um, uh, or even at the recruiting process. It's a mindset that embraces certain principles, as well as supported by tools, to create that culture of excellence. Now, uh, In Search of Excellence was a book that came out in the 90s, uh, actually probably even before that time. So organizations have been pursuing 
uh, excellence for a long time. And it's difficult to do. We live in a complex world, um, in a complex ecosystem, um, but we need to look at how every employee can see, deliver, improve that flow of value to the customer. So usually uh, we see there's four key characteristics. You may have end-to-end -end product supply and basic services that are optimized, maybe streamlined to minimize costs and, uh, and uh, defects, if you will, or hassles. Hassle is a form of a defect. Operations are standardized, simplified, tightly controlled. Um, and when, I, when we teach the mastering agile organizational design, we talk about that agile doesn't mean chaos. We also talk about having a stable platform and the ability to pivot based on that stable platform. So you can tightly control things. It's not chaos, but it's not stifling that you can't do continuous improvement. Also requires that you've got management systems, particularly management information systems that create a transparent value of, of data so that uh, you can take the right actions when you need to. Um, and lastly, we find that uh, if you're really in a lean uh, perspective, you, you're trying to get waste out of your system delivering value to the employees. It costs you less and helps provide products or services, responses to your customer more efficiently, more effective. Yeah. So when we first started thinking about this uh, three years ago, maybe three and a half years ago now, Pierre, um, we are listed a whole bunch of all the uh, activities, both those primary value adding activities that we show in that diagram last week, as well as all those supporting activities. And we listed them all out and we got people excited about writing to you know, HR activities, IT activities, and it really comes down to a simplified version of executing those primary value adding activities and those supporting activities while you're transforming, while you're formulating, and you're going to continue to do that once you have, you're going to be executing those primary and supporting activities within the context of that new strategy. And of course, as you go along, you need to evaluate if the strategy is working. So it means it implies you need some data here. So those primary activities could be as, as we had on the, uh, the value chain diagram last week, the inbound logistics, outbound logistics, marketing, sales, and service, as well as procurement, technology, HR, IT, firm infrastructure, uh, et cetera. But they have to be in alignment with the strategy to, to continue to deliver value to those, those different stakeholder groups that we mentioned last week. Jim, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Um, Chris uh, weighed in with a question she thought uh, it would be great if you could address right now. A few decisions left to the discretion of rank and file employees. Can you discuss now, is this considered with employee engagement or coming later? Ah, so um, one of the aspects of operational excellence and continuous improvement is that you're empowering decision making where, the, where it's uh, at closest to uh, the touch point of the customer. So uh, if you are not empowering frontline workers to make decisions within their span of control, that's already part of your operating model because in term, it affects the leadership component of your operating model, as well as how decisions are made and who has the information and the knowledge to make those decisions. If you had a culture that required you to go up and down the chain, one, it's not very agile, two, you could get misadvice uh, as you go up and down the chain. And I see this work when I did, uh, I helped the Air Force out to streamline how they built their consensus on their positioning to take their budget forward to uh, Department of Defense and OMB. So you want to put the decision uh, down to the lowest level that's, um, that has the expertise to make those decisions. Chris, did I get your question correct? You can put it in the chat. What, as uh, Chris is thinking about that, the other aspects that we have in terms of evaluation, one of the things we noted, and this is a big thing with me, there was a book that came out by one of our members about five or six years ago, and it was really talking about uh, agile strategic planning. Uh, and it was usually, it was based on the concepts from the agile software manifesto where you, um, you get data, you make decisions to move ahead to the next requirement that you have uh, in your stack, if you will. But 
not every organization has the same operational speed. Um, nonprofits are different sometimes, depending on the nature of the nonprofit, uh, different than government agencies. Uh, it gets very complex, as someone on this call knows, especially if you have uh, shared goals across agencies. How do you get data collected from each of those uh, actors, if you will? Um, so the pace of capturing and reporting on performance data varies. And when we look at next week, we'll talk about the governance function as it relates to providing, uh, as it uh, relates to, um, I'm sorry, Chris threw me off here, left at rank mild place on Hispanico. Yeah, correct. Um, and so you need, based on that understanding of the, the data that's needed, that is going to require to give you the information you need to whether or not, not only are you executing correctly or effectively based on your, your, your operating model, but also is your, are you moving the needle towards achieving that strategy, that long-term vision, those long-term goals. So it comes out to relating and needing performance management systems um, that provides information to each level so that you can be transparent it instills accountability, like Pierre said earlier this afternoon, and empowers decision making. Um, and in an agile organization, it could be at the individual, or it could be at a team level, uh, or it could be at a higher level. But at all of those levels, um, it requires a, a good system of providing the information so that you can not only hold account people accountable, but you can be agile and make decisions as it's needed. And that includes collecting information from the outside world. Because remember, you should be also doing external uh, analysis of what's happening in the marketplace. What are those things that you're sensing out there? How are you going to respond to those things if you're really trying to be effective in the kind of uh, VUCA world that we live in today? Next slide. Uh, could you give me just one second, Jim? Uh, Jim? Richard, I want to I wanna reiterate something that Chris asked. Okay, and this is very important. Okay, the five group of activities are all done simultaneously. What does that mean? Okay, and it, I love this question. Okay, when you, I'll give you an example. When you're transforming, when you're doing a digital transformation, the act of transforming is transform org. If while I'm transforming, I want to get Jim to help me, I'm doing engage. And while I'm revising a project during the transformation project, I'm doing governance. Okay, it's very important. All these activities are done at the same time. It's just the hat that you put and the focus of the activity is different. This is very, very important because you do engage when you do formulate, implement, and execute. And you even do engage when you do governance. The point is, while I'm doing an act of governing, am I going to engage somebody, right? If I am, I'm doing engage. This is very, very important. And that's why we focused on the five groups. That's why we separated them so that in the future, it's easy for us to add tools and technique and activities because the focus of each of the groups is different. But nonetheless, when I'm working with Jim, I'm doing at the same time transform, engage, and govern. It just depends on the decision I'm going to make and the focus on what I want to do. Thanks, Jim. Sure. Uh, Jeff Jeff's, uh, Jefferson is really um, liking that explanation, uh, Pierre. Um, so let's open up to questions and uh, uh, answers from uh, uh, for any of the content that we covered uh, this afternoon, whether it's on transform or uh, execute. Okay, I want to uh, I want to scroll back up and uh, to the uh, the beginning presentation uh, by you, Pierre, on uh, trans planning for transformation. Uh, Chris uh, posted a question about the metaphor you used of uh, building the bridge, and where she posed the question: If I have the overall plan without detail, how do I? design the master schedule without it? Ah, voila. That's the question. You can't do it. You can't do it. If you want to have a good master schedule, you need an overall plan. 
I think she and needs that's to go around. I, I beg your pardon? How can you do the schedule if you don't have the details? Because the overall plan you said was high level. Okay, let me rephrase that. The overall plan, let's, let's say you take the bridge, okay? The bridge is going to say you're going to have a substructure, you're going to have a foundation, and so forth. The master schedule is not detailed, okay? The master schedule is at the level of the overall plan. So it's just going to say, okay, I want to do the bridge or I want to do this transformation. First project, I got to do X. Second project, I got to do Y. To a project, I'm gonna, it's not going to go into the detail, but it's going to confirm to you that you need to do that project before doing the other. And it's going to confirm to you that the output of your first project will be, you, will be used as input for your second project. That's the key. So, okay, master schedule does not mean that it's detailed. It's a high level plan. And then for each project, then you will do a detailed design and you will do a, 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 a detailed scheduling at the project management level. Yeah, so Jefferson, I love your question about, is it a list of milestones that you're trying to achieve as opposed to details? I was working on a project for, it was a joint project, a very huge transformation uh, in the wake of 9-11 between Treasury, Homeland Security, and another agency I can't forget at this point in time. But we had, there was going to be a 10-year overall plan in order to build out the capability to enable us to communicate when a bad thing happens like 9-11 because of the, uh, the, uh, the band, the 800 series band that our cell phones operate on. Um, I was tasked with putting together a 10-year training and engagement plan. So it's in communications, train. How do you train people when they're uh, officers, uh, front, uh, you know, front, first responders when they're working third shifts? Or you know, how do you get all that stuff done? All you could do with that 10-year outlook is take a swag at what a master schedule might be. Uh, and then when you get to those, you're going to be able to do more effectively with those projects at the detail level. So I've lived through it uh, and I see how it could be how it could be done. In fact, uh, no, it wasn't the Rescue 21 system. Um, it was, uh, what was they call it? It was the, re it was the 800 uh, hertz, uh, megahertz bandwidth that they wanted to get everyone, like they had sewer systems and local municipalities using that system. So the emergency response aspect could not be executed in the way that we wanted to. And you had, you had to get people off that 800 spectrum, get them on a lower level spectrum of communications and get everybody else on that new spectrum. You had to have tunneling to existing systems to make them secure, very complex project. But um, that was heck, many years ago, 2003. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm just gonna add one thing. We gave a class, okay, in my inter enterprise architecture class, which we taught to like almost a thousand people. We always ask them, have you ever done a project that was done in the right order at the right time? Okay. And we talk about, you, we talk to that, these are complex companies, okay? We're not talking about small and medium company. We're talking about complex companies, complex ERP systems and so forth. And the answer is always the same. We've never done a project where all the prerequisite projects were done when, as they should have been done. Never. There's always something, a dependency that should have been taken into account and that should have been done in a a priori project. So that's why you need the overall plan and that's why you need over. And you're still going to make mistakes. You're still going to make mistakes. Don't think you're not going to, you're going to make mistakes. But at least you'll be sure that you don't make 10, 15, 20 million dollar mistakes. Typically in an ERP, a lot of people say, okay, we need an ERP. What are they going to do? They're going to install the ERP. And while they implement the ERP, they're going to say, well, our infrastructure is not good. Our backup system is not good. Our telecommunications is not good. So what they're going to do, they're going to go back and update the infra. Once they did that, they have to redo the ERP project. So that's why there are a lot of overruns because they don't think what comes before and they don't think about what comes after the particular project because people focus too much on schedule and budget. Schedule and budget are key, but the primary objective 
is to transform the operating model. Rule number one, implement the operating model. To do that, do a high level master plan, which you will change and you will adjust. And then please go to budget and schedule. Don't go to budget and schedule before you have the overall idea or the chances that you are on budget and on schedule are very high, but two years after you're gonna do rework and you're gonna bust your budget five times. That's proven, it's proven. You know, given the, a lot of the data that came out of PMI and the Brightline initiative uh, three years ago about the amount of, and then the side act has followed up that message about the amount of money that's wasted in trying to execute this strategy and the whole world about strategy fails. Well, it's because why we're talking about this transformation. It doesn't have to be a huge transformation. It could be a little T, a little transformation. You might be changing two components of the operating model in order to align the organization with the new strategy. And I think, and even though there hasn't been a research on it, my sense is if people aren't taking the time to identify what needs to change in order to align the current operating model to the new strategy, it could be all those six components or it could be one or two, that's the root cause of why execution and strategy is a gap that we hear about in the industry all the time. That's why we took the time to put this transform activities into the body of knowledge. I want to uh, jump in and uh, pose a question to uh, Dean Black, who's on a train somewhere between Ottawa and Toronto right now. And uh, this is specific to what uh, Chris asked earlier on about few decisions being left to the discretion of the rank and file. And uh, Dean offered two uh, Chris, the idea of the open strategy concept. Dean, can you add some uh, meat to that bone? Yeah, sure. It's a relatively new concept, and uh, it's one that I recommend to Chris. It's uh, very, very similar to open innovation, and I think most of the folks on board with us today would recognize it. Open strategy, I think, would be a solution uh, for what Chris is describing. Solomon, you joined us visually. Do you have a question, sir? You're on mute. You're still on mute, Solomon. No, I'm mute, sorry. Well, we'll, we'll wait for Solomon to get his uh, his voice back. Uh, were there other questions, Richard, that you saw in chat that we need to address? Richard? Uh, yeah, I was muted. Uh, I'd like uh, Chris uh, Schaefer to unmute and give us a little more detail and, and context and, and framing for the uh, front line at the boarding gate uh, metaphor that you uh, shared. Hey, well, she was talking about conformance, uh, not being measured on it, right? Well, first of all, that's not a metaphor. That's actually a true story. And it's <laughs> version number one is an airline in which the, in which the uh, gate agent was not allowed to let somebody board um, outside of their group. And the other one is a different airline renowned for its customer service. And the gate agent was not measured on conformance of whether or not people boarded in their own group. So, so part, of, part of what I see in that is that there are choices of, that can be made about the amount of discretion that the front line has. Mm -hmm. and, and what I, I could give you another example where in direct store delivery, the person who delivers merchandises um, the product in a grocery, so this is grocery store, has a lot more information about 15 different performance variables that could be done in that store. And there's no possible way that a, that a supervisor could oversee the activity of this one individual. This one individual has to have a lot of discretion and the system actually changed so that the frontline direct store delivery agent um, did the planning, did the planning, did, did the business planning projections 
for things like increasing facings, increasing sales of certain items, uh, installing uh, capital equipment like cold boxes, et cetera. So I, so I, I guess my, it's just that the text read that you tightly constrain, here, here's what it said, is that you tightly, um, you leave few decisions to discretion of the rank and file employee. What slide was that on? Do you remember? No, I didn't write down the number, but it's, <laughs> I didn't write down the number. The operational excellence, I think, was the title of the slide. To take notes, I'm writing as fast oh, as Oh, yeah, yeah. So. Did you see it? Yeah. Okay. And, and it, that comes from a particular uh, reference in the body of knowledge that talks about really streamlining things that you and that's simple decisions that um it's not that complex it's not the kinds of examples you talked about so it's not to not to say you because the other concept is you want to drive decision making where it makes the most sense to people with the knowledge right yeah. uh -huh. right so yeah um we can tighten that up and make it more clear i apologize for that I have another uh, uh, question I want to throw at you guys. It hold on, comes... hold on, Richard. Richard, hold on. Solomon took himself off mute. He's oh. been patiently waiting for us. Solomon. Good. He's not moving. He's frozen. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, Richard. Sorry. Well, while Solomon unfreezes, uh, Ola Fulorenzo had a question. Uh, uh, the main challenge I have been having is how to catch ball, in parentheses, to build consensus, the strategy with all levels of the organization. I am supporting an organization of 500 staff, and it is very challenging gathering inputs from all levels. Any thoughts of what we can do? Yeah, so I cover that in the engagement chapter pretty pretty well, but we also talk about it in the mastering adaptive organizational design. And it depends on the type of structure of that organization. If it's more hierarchical, you need a different method in order to do, to do that than if you're more uh, adaptive as an organization. If you're working in an industry that in itself is very hierarchical and structured, um, you also have to adapt the type of tools, the change management tools, in order to uh, build that consensus up and down and across for that strategy. So that's where that engagement plan and communication plan for all the stakeholder groups that are, are within the scope of your strategy project needs to be laid out um, from the get-go and modify it throughout the formulation as well as modifying it through the transformation and the execution activities. So, um, yeah, you're right. If you're in a if you're in a hierarchical organization where um, the manager is responsible for driving it down to the next level, then that person drives it down to the next level, et cetera. That's a different approach than an organization that has a whole town hall. It says, "Here's what's changing. This is our new strategy. This is what we need for everybody. Let's break out to breakout groups and have a discussion about what it might uh, affect." And you have facilitators planned and trained to anticipate the questions that uh, people might have in that open town hall environment. But not every organization is open to having that. That's an incomplete answer because we teach a whole day on that in the other uh, other program. But very good question. And just uh, add and just add a little detail uh, there. Sure. I'm just I'm, good, I'm just going to add my two cents, which may seem obvious, but I'm still going to say it. It's not because it's big that you need to involve everybody. You need to involve people from all levels, but you don't need to involve everybody. That would be my answer. So I would t t take the high, you know, the, the, the big groups that are key, whether it's hierarchical, like Jim said, or so forth. And I would take specific people that can help me with the buying after and so forth, and I would involve. Them. The first thing I would do, I would do that. I would minimize the scope of the people involved. Have as many as possible to have a broad view, but I would minimize the, the number of people involved in the actual design of the, the strategy. Yeah, so we're talking about uh, change agents, right? So you do have your core strategy formulation team. We talk about then your extended team, as Pierre was just highlighting, who else do you need to bring in to that conversation for the formulation? But then once you have that strategy kind of baked and you got it approved uh, by whoever needs to approve it, 
um, you're going to update your communications and engagement plan uh, as you identify, uh-oh, we need three transformation efforts here in order for us to be able to execute this new strategy. And then you, after you finish this transformation, you also update your communication and engagement. Strategy. So it's a continuous process. Hence why we say all five groups of activities are ongoing all the time. And I'll just add in uh, in ending on that uh, that uh, Ola is is posing that question coming from a public sector uh, position. Yeah, and that's so. There's an, a great reference for that was written by um, uh, someone from MITRE, and it was kind of a, a study that they did uh, best practices for helping government leaders become more agile. So think of if you're coming from a hierarchical top-down government agency, whether it's a federal or regional level. Um, this was a very good resource based on real research that was done to highlight some good practices um, and, and uh, to get into the habit of introducing agile notions, uh, no matter how hierarchical the organization is. So it's less of a catch ball uh, and some other options that you might have. So uh, I, I'll, I'll have Richard put that uh, reference because we actually use it in the strategy uh, course that uh, Doug had talked about, it's going on right now. We actually use that as a reference uh, for those in the public sector. Uh, Richard, do you want to put up the final two slides? Or, or uh, Pierre, you want to put up their final two slides as we close? Okay, out? I'll put it. So as a, as a reiteration, if you have any questions, I think Doug still might be here. He may have bugged off, but his email address is there, dmaris at lblstrategies.com. Um, there's his phone number two, and he can take any questions that you may have about uh, how they can help, uh, LBL can help you uh, prepare for the upcoming exam if you're so inclined. And I think Dean might still be on if you have questions about okay, the certification nice. program itself. So I'll just leave, give it a couple minutes to see if uh, anyone has questions for Dean or Doug. And actually, uh, <clears throat> let's unmute. If you have a question, just go ahead yeah. and uh, unmute and ask. Ah, so Kevin W says, when is the next exam sitting? Dean? The next exam sitting is uh, 1 to 16 December. And then there'll be another one in the spring. Is that correct, Dean? That is correct. We have four cycles in 2023 for the first time. And the first cycle comes to us uh, towards the end of February. For more information, you can go to the ASP, ISP website, strategyassociation.org. Um, is there a deadline to apply for the exam cycles, Dean? The uh, deadline that we use is roughly three days before the end of the cycle because we need about 72 hours to respond uh, to an application um, and then for someone to be able to sit and write. So in this regard, the uh, deadline for the next cycle will, be, will fall on midnight the 12th of December. Yeah, please, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, for people that are planning to write the exam in December, if possible, uh, is it advisable to stick to the, uh, the body of knowledge document that we have now? It's like I heard that maybe there is another one that will be coming, or coming out in the next two weeks. Is it enough to just focus on the body of knowledge we have now? or I should wait for the one that is coming out. Yeah, Dean could add to this, but if you go last week in our session, we talked about the different resources to help you prepare for sitting for the exam. And that's on ISP's website, again, strategyassociation.org. Um, so for example, uh, several years ago, we developed flashcards based on body of knowledge 2.0, which is what the exam that's coming up in December is based on. The exam in December is based on body of knowledge 2.0, not 3.0.
Um, okay. There's also uh, some other suggestions on the ISP website with preparing for the exam, in addition to LBL's program that has a 96% passage weight for those who have gone through that program. Um, so hopefully that oh, answers. I'm already, I'm already on that. <laughs> All right, you're ready on that. There you go. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and, and maybe look for a study group. We found one of the best practices was having a study group. It may be too late because it's too close, but there's still a month of November left to pull together people for, you know, five weeks and you cover, uh, you know, one week you cover lead, one cover, one, um, another week you cover plan, another one, you know, so um, there might be some ways to do it. <laughs> If you have other questions, maybe reach out to, to Doug for that or Dean directly. And Dean's uh, website information or email contact information is on the Strategy Association.org website. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So I have seven after. Uh, there might be one more message I'm seeing. Do you get all the chats? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, right, 19, uh, 19, good example there. All right, uh, if there are no more questions or comments, we appreciate your time. Actually, and, uh, let's uh, circle over to uh, Solomon one more time. Solomon, are you there, and uh, do you have a question? We'll, we'll encourage Solomon to submit his question. Um, uh, you know, to either Doug or myself, um, because he's having a hard time. Hello, hello. Go ahead, Solomon. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, sorry, because uh, here uh, my internet connection is bad, is unstable. Uh, so I joined you lately. Arrange my question to another another session. Okay, well, we'll join us next uh, next Tuesday and we'll take questions about the entire three sessions. We'll extend it if we need to, for sure. We want to make sure you have your question answered. Okay. okay. All right, Richard, take us out. Stop recording. Okay, I'm going to stop the uh, recording.